In this video, we will attack Backdrop CMS through an exposed Git repository, which will lead us to a sensitive data. Inside the machine, we will leverage a utility tool to modify a crucial binary inside Linux, which will help us drop to a root shell. As a bonus, we will analyze the foothold exploit and give you techniques on how to secure the box, such as preventing Git access via Apache config. As usual, let's start with the scanning phase. In my previous videos, I always use a combination of nmap and a Python script. That allows me to quickly get the open TCP ports and move on with manual enumeration while waiting for service information from nmap. In this video, let's combine both by using Rust scan. The syntax is much simpler from nmap. We just pass the target IP and run this immediately. It first perform a quick TCP port scan. Then it passed those ports to nmap to perform some basic service enumeration. As you see, this is much faster, but it only shows very minimal information about the service. In order to modify the nmap flags being used, we need to terminate it with double dash. Then after that, we can pass the nmap flags we want to use, such as running the default scripts via dash sc. Let's wait for this to finish. Okay, it's done, so let's understand the information. As usual, we have an SSH port open, but that is not a low-hanging fruit for us. Let's move on to port 80. It is running Apache. It has a title called dog, which is the name of the box. Then it was able to discover robots.txt. This contains the endpoints that should not be scanned by web crawlers. This is good information for us since we will have more things to enumerate later. We can also see that this is a content management system running in on backdrop CMS. And the most interesting part is it was able to detect a Git directory. This means we might be able to download it and get any sensitive information. Let's access the website and look around. The first thing we can notice here is that the usernames are exposed. Others are anonymous, so probably we can create our own post and test for some injection attacks. Let's see what's inside this first entry. The topic is about dog health. I don't see anything unusual as of now. But we can pass the words we found in this page to a fuzzer that can be used for directory enumeration or login brute forcing. Some of these words might be valid password or they can be a directory path. One important information we need to determine is the version of this CMS. That will help us identify if there are any existing exploit we can use. We can try to inspect the HTML code. It says backdrop CMS1, but there is no minor version. Let's look for comments. We found some, but they don't have anything to do with the version. Let's quickly search for version just to make sure we didn't miss anything. Nothing interesting came up. Next is we can try to look into the server response headers. It only show the web server, but not the CMS version. Another common place where versions can be found is on the readme file. Let's see if we can access it. Okay, it is present, but looks like the version is not here. The only clue we have is the PHP requirement. One last technique we can do is to check if the source code is hosted somewhere. Let's try GitHub first. It is hosted there, so let's go to the repository. Then let's see if we can match the PHP requirement we found against the one inside the repository. This one needs a PHP 7 or higher, so meaning the one installed in the machine most likely is a lower version. We can try to search the code and see if the version we found appears anywhere in the commits. Nothing interesting here. Or we can try changing the tags and perform the matching there. The current is 1.31.1. Let's try changing to the next lower version. It matched the one we saw on the box. How about if we choose another lower version? It still matches. So, meaning the version the box is running is lower than 1.31. It's not good enough, but at least we have some idea. Let's move on. The next thing we want to enumerate is the login. We already found a username, so let's try that. As a starter, I will put the same username as the password because its format contains both uppercase and lowercase. There is a chance it was reused as a password. It didn't work. Can we enumerate usernames? Let's try appending something at the end. Unrecognized username. That's interesting, meaning we can look for other valid users. Let's look for an admin account. Nothing came up. Is there a default credentials? Nothing as well. Lastly, let's go to the about page and check. There is a support email here. Let's try that. unrecognized username as well. It looks like we hit a dead end on this part. There are other login bypass like SQL injection, but that most likely won't work since content management systems already have protection against that attack. So the next thing we need to enumerate is the Git directory. Based from our nmap scan, there is a Git repository accessible in this path. When accessing a Git directory over HTTP, there are a few things we can check. One would be the commit logs. To do that, we need to go to this path. 
Fed is the current active commit or the tip of the branch in a Git repository. There is one commit. The interesting part here is that the author email is exposed. The commit describes a to-do list, which seems an additional feature in the website. In order to enumerate this properly, we need to download this on our attacker machine. There are several tools in GitHub that can do that. Let's try the one I always use, which is Git Dumper from Git Tools. This is a very old tool, but it still works. Let's copy this script and let's run it. This is now downloading the different Git objects and may take a while, so I will pause the video. Download is complete. We don't see any files right now, but we can perform Git operations to inspect the repository. Let's start by checking the Git status. There are a lot of files deleted. A quick way to restore all of them is to perform a reset on the tip of the branch. Now they are back. Since this is a PHP project, an interesting file to look first is the settings.php. Just on the top part, you can clearly see a database credential. As usual, whenever we recover a password, it is good to try this out against the different authentication mechanisms. Let's try accessing the login page using this password and the username we saw from one of the entries. It didn't accept it, but it's okay. We can just take note of this password and reuse it somewhere else later. Let's go back to the Git repository. Another thing we can enumerate is to search for other traces of the author. This might gives us more clues on what are the changes on the file. Nothing came up, but I will escape the dot sign just in case. No luck. How about if we just search for the domain? There is another username, Tiffany. We can try to reuse this, so let's go back to the login page. Then, enter the username and the database password. We are in, so it is always a good enumeration practice to always try to reuse logins whenever we recover any kind of credentials. This saves us time and avoid getting into rabbit holes. Based from the amount of functionalities on the top bar, looks like we are an administrator of the site. There are a lot of information here and it can be intimidating and easy to get lost. So let's try looking for the interesting functionalities such as checking the current users. The more credentials we see, the better. So for example, like this one, we see a lot of users. We can put all of these names under a file and perform password spraying over SSH. If we are lucky, we have easy path to the box. Let's also put the password inside a file and let's run Hydra. Nothing came up, but let's not lose hope, but instead look for more entry points. Another thing we can look are functionalities that allows us to upload something. In this case, we can see an option that allows us to install a module. Only thing we need to find out is what is the module format in order for us to create one. Let's take note of that for now and look for other things. A while ago, we were trying to enumerate the CMS version, but unable to do it accurately. Now that we are inside the application, there is a high chance that we will be able to get the right version. Let's try this report's functionality. We now see the CMS version. We are correct on our estimate a while ago that the version is lower than 1.31. Now let's see if there are available vulnerabilities and exploits for this version, such as installing a malicious module. We can see a remote code execution exploit for that exact version. This is exactly what we are looking for, an exploit that will allow us to install a malicious module. Let's do the exploit analysis later. So for now, we will just follow the instruction on how to use this tool. Once the setup is done, we can run it like this. We just pass the URL, username, and password. The exploit author did a great job putting useful information here for us to better understand what is happening. It first gets an authenticated session using the credentials we passed. Then it enables maintenance mode. After that, it uploads a tarball file, which most likely contains the malicious module. Then it looks like it extracted the module on this path, which then we can call over HTTP. Looks like the exploit worked. Let's check our current user to confirm. Yes, we are the application user. And we are located inside the modules directory. Let's see if we can get out from that location. It didn't work, so we need to come up with a better shell. Let's open a listener on our attacker. Then let's use this exploit to trigger a reverse shell that will call back to us. I always use the make FIFO format as it works most of the time. Maybe in another video, I will explore the mechanism of this type of reverse shell so we all understand it. We received a callback, so let's make this shell stable. Let's use script command to execute bash interpreter and discard the output by redirecting it to dev null. Then we will hit control Z to put this in the background. After that, we need to change some terminal settings by forcing this to echo any input such as passwords. Then we will put back the session into the foreground by using FG command. And finally, adding reset command to initialize the terminal state. This now gives us a better and more stable shell, which also prevents us from accidentally disconnecting when we hit control C. 
Okay, now we are able to get out from the modules directory. Let's look for other users in the box. There is one, which is John Cusack. Let's confirm if we can see his home directory. It is present, and there is another home directory named Jobert. I think we missed this from the password file, so doing verification by checking the contents of slash home is a good practice. Let's try to switch to John Cusack using the password we got. It worked again, meaning that password was used all throughout this machine, which is not a good practice. Let's see what's inside his home directory. Nothing interesting aside from the user flag. Does he have any pseudo permissions? Yeah, he have one. There is a command here called B, which can be executed as root. This means when we run this command, the effective UID we are getting is zero, meaning we are executing this in the context of root. That will give us a direct path. There are many ways to exploit this. First, let's see if we have a modified permission on the binary so we can replace the content with our custom command. It is a symlink and reveals that it is a tool for backdrop CMS. Let's check the permission. It is owned by root, meaning we cannot modify it. Even the directory itself is owned by root, so we cannot do some symlink manipulation here. That might be a dead end, so the next step is to understand how the command works. Let's open the file. Based from the description, it looks like this is an official tool for Backdrop CMS and not some custom-made binary. If it is the latter, then there is a high chance the binary contains vulnerabilities since it doesn't undergo proper review process by the community. We see here some includes, which tells us the other files this command is dependent on. Another way of understanding how the command works is by going straight to the help page. Let's see if it has something like that. Yeah, we can see it. It accepts several parameters. Only the command parameters is required since it is inside angle brackets. The rest are optional. Let's look for the possible commands we can pass. There are configuration-related commands such as exporting and importing. This is not too interesting at this point as we already gain foothold inside the box. And we already have access to the configuration files inside the Git repository. We also see commands for exporting and importing a database. This is not interesting as well since we don't care about the application right now. What we do care is how to escalate to root. There are other commands for displaying various information about the application. Not so interesting as well. At the end, we see some advanced commands. It allows us to execute PHP code using eval, which is really interesting. And another command that can execute a PHP script. Those two functionalities are the ones we should target. I think we can try the PHP script first, so we will create one inside our home directory. For simplicity, let's add a sleep command, but we can upgrade it later once we confirm this is working. Let's pass this PHP script to the command. It says unknown terminal, which may be because we are on a reverse shell. Below that, it is also complaining about bootstrap level. Some utility tools like this needs to be run on the root of the application. So let's go inside the doc root and run it from there. It looks like it is working as there is a delay on the output. What we can try now is to add an SUID bit on the bash binary so we can drop to a root shell. For the record, the current permission of bin bash is 755. If our attack is successful, we must see an SUID bit in this part. Now let's execute this. It worked. We see the SUID bit here. In order to drop to a root shell, we need to execute bin bash with dash p parameter so the set UID will be preserved. Yeah, it is successful. Our effective UID and GID is root. That means we can now perform privileged actions inside this machine. Before we end this video, let's look back on the exploit and analyze it. On the top, we can see it is importing the tar file module, which indicates that it will consolidate files and upload it. Author used a custom function named die, which is analogous on how you can terminate the current script in PHP. There is also another function that handles basic HTML parsing, such as looking for hidden tokens. The authentication happens on this part. We see the user login endpoint and other parameters being passed, such as the password and token forms. On this part, the maintenance mode is being enabled. This might be required before you upload or install a module. Once maintenance mode is enabled, the exploit will create the malicious module locally. The first part of the module is the info file. This serves as a metadata for the module, which gives information such as type and backdrop CMS version. There is a second file, which is an actual PHP script, which contains the malicious code. This code allows us to provide a shell command via a git parameter. Those two files will be included inside the tarball.
The exploit uses a multi-part encoder which helps uploading the file. Not sure if the standard request library cannot do this though. It's interesting to see here that there is a custom backdrop CMS content type that is being accepted. I'd never seen this before as the common content types I saw are JSON, form URL encoded, and plain. Once the upload is done, the last part is just to access the PHP script over HTTP. Now let's look at different ways on how we can secure this box. Exposing the Git repository over the web is the main entry point of the attacker. It is not a good practice to leave this directory on the doc root of the application, especially in production setup. But in cases where that directory needs to be present, we can do modifications on the web server side to prevent access. The box is using Apache, so we will edit the Apache 2 configuration file. Then we will add a directory match block. This tells Apache that for all endpoints that matches .git, the access must be denied first, and this is valid for all requests originating from any network. Now, if we reload a patch and go back to the web, it gives us a forbidden error. Now, that may sound good, but that still gives the attacker an idea that there is a .git repository on the doc root. Our goal as a defender is to make attackers' life difficult, so let's try a better way. Using same configuration file, we can tell Apache to return 404 not found instead of forbidden. In this manner, we will prevent further information from attacker, which he can use for any other attacks. Now, if we reload Apache and access again the Git directory, it now says 404 not found. I hope you learned something today. If you find my content valuable, please support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. See you on the next one.